Hi, my name is Tim McPherson from Saltwater Boat Angling, uh, and this is an, a webinar in association with our friends at Navionics. And today we're going to talk about that uh, critter you can see on the screen there, one of my favourite fish. Uh, it's, of course, the black bream. And today we're going to talk about catching black bream. Uh, and there's a picture of uh, a beautiful picture of a male black bream that's just been caught. You can see that fantastic azure stripe across its forehead and face. Uh, lovely little fish. We're going to talk about tackle uh, and the techniques we use to catch black bream. We're also going to talk about the habitats that they live in and the kind of marks you might find. We're going to talk about the breeding of them, uh, the breeding habits of bream, which are pretty interesting. And we're going to have a look at some of the other species of bream you can catch. By way of a preamble, they are, of course, shoalfish, as we all know. Uh, I prefer to fish with light tackle, um, and I'll explain why a bit later on. They are, of course, summer visitors. They start appearing in our waters in, in March. Uh, they breed right through to the end of sort of May, June time. So they'll stay pretty much until the end of the autumn, sometimes as late as December. And of course, they do have favoured habitats that they uh, prefer. So uh, I'm going to give you five bream fishing tips here. The first one is use a long rod, if you can, with a sensitive tip. A uh, long rod is useful in terms of being able to uh, uh, keep yourself away from the main body of anglers on the boat if you need to do that. And a sensitive tip is more important because it means really that you can feel the bites much better. They do tend to be sort of fast and hard biters. Uh, and if you've got control over your bait uh, and you can see and feel those bites better, you're going to catch more fish. I tend to use small hooks, size one or less. Uh, I use J-hooks, you can use circle hooks, but bream very rarely get uh, gut hooked. They have very small mouths, uh, hence the small hooks, and also J-hooks are perfectly adequate for it. I use a technique called trotting down tide, it's pretty straightforward. The reason I do this is because, if I can, is because you, you end up being able to cover more ground. If you can control the bait and the, and the lead effectively and trot down with your uh, with the tide you can get away from the other anglers if there are those on the boats but also i tend to find that um, bigger fish are a little bit further away than the main body of fish that first come to your ground bait i would uh, uh, when you hit the bottom reel up five turns it just keeps it off the bottom keeps it away from snags keeps it away from pouts who tend to hug the bottom uh, and um, you can bounce your lead as you trot it down the tide you don't have to do this but it does increase the, the catch rate. And finally, ground bait. And we're going to talk about ground bait now. So ground bait, commonly called chum. Uh, the important thing I think for ground bait is to make sure you create particulate matter. And in order to do that, uh, my best tip for this is to, is to have a frozen ball of ground bait. Uh, and that's pretty straightforward. Mash up fish guts and, uh, and all the stuff you're going to put into the ground bait, including a bit of something to bind it together, and then freeze it. And you can see in this video, there's a frozen bucket of uh, of ground bait uh, and, and basically bring that out, put it in a bag, as you'll see in the video, and chuck it over the side when you're at anchor. And what that does is create a slow stream of ground bait going down the tide, particulate matter. And that's really important in terms of bringing the fish in and, and not feeding them too fast. Of course, if you're fishing in a big tide, you're going to go, uh, you're going to be um, wanting to make sure that you, uh, you, you've you got the fish holding in the area as long as you possibly can. So holding the shoal in the area that you're fishing and it keeps the fish feeding for much, much longer, which is obviously a really uh, useful thing, particularly when you're bringing more and more fish into the area. And also if you're fishing in a boat with a lot of people, the more ground bait you've got down there, the better it is for everybody. So let's talk about rigs. Some general ideas that I have in terms of bream rigs. Uh, I would use relatively light leads. So you obviously want to make sure you're anchored on the bottom, but if you're going to trot down tide, um, you want to make sure that you've got a lead that will be able to do that. And obviously that means you have to maintain control of that. I would probably use a lead two or three ounces lighter than one that you would normally use if you wanted to really anchor your bait on the bottom. Obviously it depends on the tide. Uh, if you've got a big tide, you're going to still going to have to use quite a big weight, but you need to feel, uh, be able to feel the bait and keep it in total control so you know uh, you know you know what's happening you can feel those bites and I'd also use low diameter line in order to do that and obviously that reduces the amount of resistance that you're going to get uh, in a tide 
and, and, and there are many, many low diameter braids or even nylons that you can use. I prefer braid, uh, generally it's low diameter and also you get that instant um, feel. There's no stretchiness and it's really important. Keep your rigs simple. You don't need a lot of stuff on the end of them. Make sure they're as simple as possible. You're fishing in probably rocky ground or a reef or maybe in a wreck. Just keep it simple because you're going to lose tackle probably and you want to make sure that you minimise uh, your re-rigging time and also the amount of uh, money you're throwing over the side. Moving on to rigs themselves. First one I'm going to look at is the Portland rig, one of my favourites. It is actually really a bolt rig that you'd use for carp fishing or, or maybe bass or smooth hands off the beach. It's very simple. It's just a, a, a line to lead arrangement uh, with a swivel on the trace and then attached to that swivel is your snud with your hook on it. It's very effective because it, it, it allows the bait to move up and down in the tide and also helicopters uh, in, the, in the tide, obviously depending on the strength of the tide that you're fishing in. But that just adds as an extra attractor. And of course, being a bolt rig, it means that once the fish has taken the bait, it pretty much hooks itself. Second one is a wishbone rig. Uh, everyone's familiar with this, I'm sure. Again, a simple hook to lead arrangement with a, with a swivel on it, but this time it's stopped by crimps and you've then got the, the snud running off it with two hooks attached to it. That arrangement you can see there has a swivel with the, the hook snuds to attached to each other running through that swivel. You can use it like that or you can fix it with two, like a, like a sort of traditional spreader. It's a pretty effective rig, pretty good for uh, trotting down tide. There's also another type of uh, wishbone rig that I sometimes use, which is based on a, a fly fishing dropper. So you have a hook length and then you tie another so you tie another hook a little bit further up from the hook uh, and you've got a hook at the front and a hook about at the back with a bait on it. Uh, it's very effective for uh, flatfish fishing for turbot or place. Next one is a pattern oster. Everybody's favourite, very simple rig, two or three hooks on a, a simple trace. Uh, and, um, it, you know, it works very well for bream, particularly at anchor. It's probably the first rig that I would use, I think, particularly if I'm match fishing for them. And in fact, I sometimes use uh, sabikis like this that are baited uh, sometimes for speed and also just baited sabikis and sometimes that works very well if you're trying to catch fish quickly in a competition or something next we look at wreck bream um, there are a lot of big bream caught on wrecks particularly late on in the in the season they tend to accumulate above and around uh, uh, wrecks uh, in in the late summer and autumn period and you can catch some very big ones you don't need heavy tackle because what you want to do is trot above the uh, the wreck uh, using float tackle as you can see from this example is also a very uh, effective way of catching them and also it's quite interesting and fun because you can see the float drifting away down tide and it gives you a visual signal uh, and this little bream was caught recently on a reef in Sussex by a friend of mine and it's just very simple sliding float with a stop knot on it make sure you get the depth right and you can that means you can keep your bait above the wreck. We'll look at bait now. One of my favourite ones is um, squid or cuttlefish. Just cut into little strips and nicked onto the hook. It's very, very durable, lasts a long time and, and bream absolutely love it. Uh, they are pretty Catholic feeders, however, and you can use pretty much any bait. If you know there are bream in the area and you've got them feeding with your particulate matter or your ground bait, uh, they'll, they'll take anything. But squid's my favourite. Next on, on the list, is particularly if you're fishing inshore on a reef or up an estuary, uh, I would uh, I would go for ragworm. That's uh, it's a very effective bait for most fish. Actually, wrasse love it as well. Uh, fish bait is always is always going to work with bream and crabs. Peeler crabs work very well, and so do hardback crabs if you're fishing uh, inshore marks. Black bream will follow gilthead bream up estuaries uh, where they go to feed on hardback crabs so you, you you're if you're using crabs it's a very effective I I bait for that kind of fishing um if you're using soft baits particularly uh, peeler crabs it's a very very good idea to uh use whipping elastic and just keep just keeps the obviously keeps the bait on long because they attack it and demolish it very very quickly soft baits don't last very long with a shoal of bream moving on swiftly we'll talk about the habitats that bream prefer and again that picture there you'll see is a, a classic bream ground. Actually, that's a nest site, which we'll talk about a bit later. Rocky reefs, uh, areas where they might be breeding. 
full of food, full of invertebrates and stuff that they like to feed on. Broken ground, you'll often find them on broken ground, particularly after the breeding season, the, the fish will move off the breeding site and kind of move into any areas nearby where again, you, you can find uh, invertebrates and, and other food stuffs like shrimps and crabs and crustaceans. Wrecks, of course, we talked about wrecks. They are found, often found on wrecks in the autumn. And then finally, estuaries. I've mentioned this a couple of times now. Estuaries, you'll find in the West Country, uh, particularly gilthead bream, but also black bream. They'll move quite a long way up, two or three miles up an estuary with the tide, uh, looking for food, feeding on crabs, feeding on worms. Uh, and uh, if you know the spots that they're going to accumulate in at the right time of the tide, you can have some fantastic estuary sport. So let's look at some well-known marks. Just as a reference, because I'm going to talk about two of these marks a bit later on in the presentation and look at them in more detail. There are many, many uh, bream marks all around the coast. I mean, pretty much wherever you find the ground that I've described just now, in the summer you'll find black bream. But some classic venues, Kingmere Rocks in West Sussex, which of course is now a marine conservation zone designated specifically to help preserve bream breeding sites. You've got um, a whole host of, of, of sites around Poole and Swanage and in the bay around there. And we'll look at that in a minute. And of course, that video you can see running is, uh, and the still picture, that is uh, Old Harry Rocks in Poole Bay. Lime Bay is another area which is very common for bream. Uh, there are many, many marks in Lime Bay. And again, there is a marine conservation zone in that area. And with all three of those areas, you're, you need to make sure you're aware of the restrictions that might be in place uh, bag limits or stuff like that. And then there are West Country wrecks, um, reefs and wrecks in the West Country. There are many, many spots down there where you can catch good bream. And most of the bigger specimens of black bream have come from either wrecks or reefs. And I think, as I said earlier, I think the British record bream was caught on a reef off Plymouth. Now we're going to talk about uh, Navionics, are the sponsors of this webinar. Uh, and look at some of their mapping software. And I'm going to do that by referring to some of the marks that, that I mentioned, well, two, in spe two specific marks that I mentioned earlier. The first one is the Kingmere um, in, in Sussex. So this is Navionics sonar chart mapping software, as you'll see it's on your tablet or your phone as an app or on your electronics device. It's really very, very detailed now. They've added a huge number of features to it. Uh, including marine conservation zones and other areas that are designated for various things, whether that's dredging or wind farms. They're clearly marked, which is very helpful, of course. And with the Kingmere, you can see that little finger of, of rocks that comes out on the Kingmere, which is one of the most famous areas for breeding and where most of the fishing happens. You can see all the contours on the bottom. It's really, really useful. It's very detailed. Now, when we zoom in on it, you can see much more clearly the finger of rock that makes up the Kingmere Reef and, and also the shape of the marine conservation zone is clearly marked on this as you've zoomed in. It shows great detail. The eastern end of the, uh, the zone is actually a, a no-take zone. No fishing is allowed, no commercial fishing, no recreational angling or any kind of thing is allowed during the breeding season in that zone. Angling is allowed in all the other zones uh, there are four of them in total. And, in, and, and, and angling also has uh, a number of voluntary codes that were put together by the Angling Trust and the local IFCA. So if you're going to fish on the Kingmere, go and look at the Sussex IFCA website and that will give you an indication of uh, the bag limits and the zones and where you can and can't fish. Very important. But you can see the fabulous detail um, that uh, is there. And I have to say that using this uh, sonar chart software has really transformed uh, my fishing and I know a number of other people who use it feel the same way because you can really get a feel for areas where you kind of knew there was a feature there but you didn't know uh, the exact details of it and you can see that much more clearly and it also gives you an, a, a way of being able to recalibrate your fishing uh, marks. Sometimes I've found that some marks I've been fishing on for a long time didn't really know what was down there and why the fish were holding until I got this. Uh, and then I realised, and sometimes I've found I've been fishing slightly off what is actually a better part of, of the mark. Uh, and I've upped my catch rates in some instances, particularly when place fishing. So now we're going to talk, we're going to look at the newest feature 
uh, and you can see that materializing on the screen and that is sonar chart shading and this is a really excellent addition to what is already pretty good mapping software uh, and you can see from this that what you get is, a, is an idea of the relief if you like of the of the rocks and the marks underwater obviously when you look at the previous map you can see the general contour lines but this gives you an actual idea of, of where the, the bottom moves up and down and again it's it's made quite a difference to a lot of uh, the fishing marks that we use regularly and also if you're going to a new area if you're going to a new area it gives you instant idea of what is down there and that's really important in terms of saving time and being efficient in terms of the way you catch fish you can see that the contours of the, of the Kingmere Reef are well documented there, that the, the, the way that the rocks and the gullies and the, and, the, and the peaks move, really, really useful in terms of where you might anchor up and where you, you know, you're going to actually catch your fish. And of course, if you've got a, if you've got a mark already that you know uh, it has produced fish, it's well worth looking at it on sonar chart shading. And of course, you can do this on your phone or your app when you're sitting at home, very straightforward. It's a brilliant addition to Navionics sonar chart mapping. So the next one we're looking at is Pool and Swanage Bay. Again, you can see the amazing detail that Navionics sonar chart software gives you with all the contours in that area. It's very, very clear. Uh, and again, that's the view you get on your tablet or your phone or your electronics device on your boat. Uh, you can see very clearly marked three uh, marine conservation zones which have been designated but as yet we don't know what the management measures are but it's really useful to have those there because then you can see you know which areas you might be fishing in and of course those zones three zones actually are very very good black bream areas for um, the local boats to fish if you've ever been out from pool you'll know that it's one of the best areas with the widest variety of fishing and you can see why from that map. Now what we're going to do is concentrate on Durlston Head. We're going to magnify this up uh, and um, uh, zoom in on, on Durlston Head and have a look at, at, at what, what it looks like. Now you can see that finger of rock coming out into or reef coming out into the bay. It's very very clear on this magnified version. You can see all the ridges and all the gullies and it gives you a really good idea of where the fish holding areas might be and that is so useful um, we, we, particularly if you haven't fished there before, even if you have, as I said earlier, it can really uh, inform you much better about what kind of uh, fishing ground you're over and give you a much better idea of whether you sh you're actually in the right position when you're anchored up or wh whether you're drifting over the right part of the bay. So what we're going to do now is look at it when you superimpose sonar chart shading onto it. Now, obviously you've still got the contours and you can see the reef as it comes out into the, into the bay, but with the mapping, uh, sorry, with the uh, shading, you get that sense of relief. So you can actually see very clearly where the ridges and the gullies are. Uh, and it really, really, again, it adds an extra dimension to kind of working out what are the best fishing marks to use. And it's really useful if you have two electronics devices next to each other in your boat. A lot of people do that. And you have the mapping and the shading on one of them and the sonar on the other. And as you go over a, a, an area, whether you're just slowly moving in the boat or drifting, you can really match up the contours with what you're seeing on the sonar, particularly if you've got a 3D sonar system. And it really it brings to life, if you like, the uh, topography of the, of the bottom and makes it, uh, as I said earlier, makes it so much better in terms of locating accurate fishing marks and working out why you know a particular area is going to hold fish so moving on we're going to talk about breeding now now black bream a protogynous and what that means is that uh, they're born most of them are born female and they turn into males at about 35 centimeters not all of them are born female but 90 percent or so of the population are and not all big fish over 35 centimeters are males but as a general rule that's what happens it's a common breeding strategy in a lot of tropical fish but it's pretty unusual in British waters I don't I can't think of another fish that does this and it's one of the reasons why this fish is so precious and why uh, conservation measures have been put in place the males have this distinctive coloring as you can see this lovely azure stripe across its face and, uh, and 
it, it's beautiful when it comes out of the water. It does fade quite quickly. The females tend to be much drabber and much greyer. So here we're going to talk about nesting and courtship. And, and this video that's running in the background here will show you a shoal of bream that have arrived on a nesting site. And you can see a nesting site in the foreground there. Uh, this footage was taken, I think, in Lime Bay. It's beautiful underwater footage from Matt Doggett. Uh, who's a specialist in this. And you can see this, this shoulder bream moving gently around the reef, uh, looking for sites, maybe to breed, uh, looking for fish. But you can see the nature of the shoaling. The males make nests on the bottom. And that nest, that rock, bare rock you can see, is actually a nest site. And here the video you can see on the right uh, there's a male there, he's, he's guarding that nest, he's moving around, he's wafting it gently, and what he's doing is he's moving any particulate matter that might have settled on the eggs, because the eggs are laid on a hard surface. And all that uh, material around the outside of the nest is material that he's actually moved himself, and they can move many kilograms of it. Um, and he swims around just looking after the eggs and making sure uh, that they're properly aerated and that there's nothing settling on top of them. So the males make the nests. The males go black in courtship as well. It's quite spectacular. You see a picture here of, of it. It's, it's quite a spectacular sight. They can go much blacker than that. They see a female. It's a courtship display. It's look at me. I'm here. Come and lay your eggs in my nest. And they've got that distinctive stripy feel to them. This is why they're called black bream. Uh, because of this. And of course, when you catch them, they're not black at all, really. They've got that uh, lovely uh, stripe on them. But Right, the male's fish guards the nest. And you can see this video on, on screen here. There's a, a male sort of patrolling around. He's gone and a rat has turned up and he thinks he can get a free meal. Um, but the male is having none of it. In he comes, whack, and chases the rat away. In fact, they'll, they'll, pretty, they'll chase pretty much anything away that wants to come and feed on their eggs. Lobsters, crabs, bigger fish, all sorts of things. Um, they're very aggressive fish. And, and it's very important. One of the reasons I've... I, I, I'm, it's very important to note that these males are guarding the eggs. Now, as anglers, we like to catch fish and take them home to eat. But I would suggest that if you're fishing over a breeding site, that you, somewhere you know is a breeding site, um, then if you catch a big male, then I would suggest you put it straight back. Because we know from research that's done that when you do that, 99% of the time they go straight back down to the nest. If you take the fish off the nest and you, and you keep it for any length of time or kill it, then that nest will die. The eggs will be eaten by other bream, wrasse, crabs, shrimps, anything. Uh, so it's really important in terms of preserving the breeding stock that we don't uh, we don't take too many big males if we're if we're fishing over a breeding site. I mean, if you're fishing a wreck in the autumn or something like that, that's completely different because they finish their breeding cycle and they've done. Um, but uh, it, particularly in the ki on the Kingmere, where there are restrictions on uh, voluntary restrictions on, on 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 landing and taking male bream, we always recommend that over a certain size maybe sort of 30 for 45 50 centimeters put them back because they will go back to their nest we also think that in these nests multiple females will lay eggs in the nest so the male will be doing his display a female will see him and think oh that looks you know I like the look of him i like the look of the nest she'll lay her eggs he'll fertilize them and then she'll go and that's the last she'll have to do with them um but we think that other females will come along and the same process will happen. So a number of females will lay eggs in one nest. And what that does is help the gen genetic diversity of the breeding stock. Uh, again, a common uh, strategy in the animal kingdom. So that's, uh, that's, that's it as far as breeding is concerned. Um, and we'll move on now and look at some of the other bream species that you can catch in British waters. And there's a list of them. So first up is the gilt head bream, uh, probably after the black bream, one of my favourite bream to catch. And you can see there's a lovely specimen that we caught in the Helford River a couple of years ago. Lovely hard fighting. Now you can see from this, the difference between black bream and gilt head bream. The gilt head bream has got that lovely gilt stripe or leaf over its nose, and it's got a very, very rounded head and those big, tough, 
lips and big peggy teeth for eating crunching away on crabs whereas the black green is a bit more delicate obviously it's got that the males have got that azure stripe and that the, the mouth is a bit more delicate the nose is kind of pinched in a little bit and the lips aren't quite as meaty because they're basically f f sort of picky feeders where they're you know picking away at stuff uh, unlike the gilt head bream which is a bit more aggressive in terms of taking on things like crabs So other bream species, very quickly, Pandora's bream, which is found out in the West Country. Red bream, you'll, you'll get that all the way up the channel as far as uh, Eastbourne uh, and Kent. Uh, they are common in the late summer. You'll catch lots of them, particularly around piers and marinas and stuff like that. And of course, then there's the raised bream, which is a slightly more unusual one, uh, not caught very often in British waters, but very common in Mediterranean areas. And then finally, the couches bream. This is relatively new in terms of the numbers that you catch. This year and last year, we're catching a lot of them. A fine fighting fish. It resembles in shape a gilt head bream. and looks a bit like a red bream. Very hard fighting. They grow pretty large. And there are more and more of them being caught in British waters. It's a very common fish now. So that's it from me. I hope you enjoyed that webinar. Um, and uh, if you need to find any more information about br black bream or anything else to do with saltwater boat angling go to www.saltwaterboatangling.co.uk you can also subscribe to the magazine on that website either digitally or in print uh, and uh, there's also lots of other stuff on it including information about our new competition and uh, videos and other content about um, uh, uh, angling in boats which we hope you will find useful if you want to contact me publisher at saltwater publishing is the email address and if you want to find out more about underwater footage and bream in general and their breeding go to mattdoggart.com that's his website he shot a lot of the footage that you've seen underwater on on this uh, webinar and it's a very interesting website with lots of stuff and finally there is of course navionics.com do go to their website where you can download the software and and find out more about the various different features that they have so thank you very much. That's me done and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.